Um, so not much there. Uh, so I want to talk about putting fossils into our phylogenetic phylogeography methods um, using a fossil candidate, so dogs and foxes and relatives. Um, by the way, I am a postdoc at the Australian National University in Craig Lawrence's lab uh, down in Australia. There's the Josh. And, um, uh, and I'm interested in phylogenetic uh, phylogeography, but also uh, tip dating, things like that, and then linking. So I should acknowledge my uh, collaborator, uh, Laura Sela, at the uh, University of Helsinki. She's an actual paleontologist and helped me a lot assembling the uh, data set for this uh, project. And uh, I'll put my acknowledgement slide here, various funding sources, and the uh, BioGeoBears uh, help page there. And um, so family candidate, it's got about 35 living species just within the subfamily candidate, which is the only living subfamily. But there's a huge number of fossil species. Um, and it's one of the best groups uh, if you want to start working on methods for including fossils in, in, uh, in analysis methods because we have more fossil species than living species. And there's a pretty good uh, data set um, from uh, paleontologists who've done monographs on the fossil taxa describing their characters. So there's a character matrix. Uh, there's the even produced a dated phylogeny kind of just cladistic and, and sort of uh, intuitive stratigraphic methods. Um, so we have a sense of what the true phylogeny is, or at least an approximation of it, and what the dates and things should be. So I've used this for a variety of projects. Uh, and just to give you a sense, right, we know that uh, uh, here's the a lineage through time plot for the uh, uh, living species. Um, but if we look at the lineage through time plot for the living species plus the fossils, right, it's dramatically different. And this is an extremely common pattern for any group where you do have a good fossil record. Um, you get a different picture looking at the living versus the living plus fossil group. All right, so how should we put fossils in? Um, there are a lot of ways you could do it, and a few have been experimented with in the literature, but I uh, sort of surveyed um, what exists, and I'll give you a, a brief uh, review. Um, one simple way to do it is put a constraint on a node range. So if you have the ranges, one species lives in A, one species lives in area B. Um, uh, in uh, these methods, we do the combinations of areas consist of our ranges. So the tip likelihood that you would put into the tips for living in area A is you have zeros for the different ranges except for area A, which gets uh, a tip likelihood of one. Um, area B would have a tip likelihood of one for area B and zeros for the rest. Um, then you do uh, the various uh, antigenetic and phytogenetic uh, uh, changes to the ranges, change the likelihood uh, through time, and you get something like this uh, at an ancestral node. And then if you have a constraint, let's say you have a fossil in area A, or in area B, um, you can multiply. If you think that that's the true range at that node, you can multiply by these likelihoods here, and uh, your new likelihoods will be that. Um, so that is one way to enforce a range at a particular node. Um, now, you can do that if you think you know the range at that node, or more realistically, maybe you'll just hypothesize that that's the range at that node. Um, so if you think that it lived, you have a fossil in B, but you don't know, maybe it lived in B and A, you just never saw a fossil in A, you can multiply by uh, 1, 1 there for ranges B and A, B. So that's a simple way to get at this. Um, and then, yeah, change the likelihoods. Uh, you could include the fossils as terminal taxa. Um, this is what we call tip dating. And if you're interested in this topic, I've worked a lot on it. Um, I, along with David Babs, and Graham Lloyd, and Gabriel Wright, have a special issue of biology letters called Putting Fossils in Trees that came out last month with a variety of articles on, on the methods for doing this. Um, if you have a tip data tree with fossils in there, you could just put those tips in, in BioGeoBears uh, just like you would uh, any other tips, put in the ranges. Again, if you think you know the ranges of those fossil species. Um, another idea is you could have a uh, direct ancestry. So we now have phylogenetic methods that can sample direct ancestors as they do a Bayesian sampling of possible uh, phylogenies. And if you want to put those into BioGeoBears, you can. Uh, what you do is you uh, identify branches that have a branch length less than a tiny number, like uh, 0.0001. 
and the beast output will actually be zero in the sample tree. Um, and then you say, the program says, okay, those are direct ancestors. They are not um, uh, separated by speciation events. So any cladogenetic changes are turned off for those branches. And in effect, you're getting information directly on the ancestral point of that branch about what the fossil range is. Um, so no cladogenesis process is applied there. So that's uh, yet another method. Um, what if you have a fossil species with a time range? Um, you could have a fossil species that's thought to extend through several geologic periods. Uh, the way to deal with this is uh, to add uh, little hooks, the way I've decided to do it, add little hooks throughout the time range, perhaps the midpoint of every geologic period, because typically the dates on fossils are done by stratigraphic zones. Um, if you wanted, you could randomly place those with a uniform distribution uh, inside that, and repeat that a bunch of times. Uh, yeah, repeat it a bunch of times and get a sample of trees, and then run your biogeography. Um, what if you have fossils, and this is quite common having worked with fossil data, what if you have fossils without any character matrix done? The best way, right, is to uh, get a huge project, collaborate with paleontologists, develop a character matrix for every fossil you can find, um, and uh, do the tip dating, et cetera, et cetera. But often that's just not feasible in any kind of reasonable time scale. Yet there are many fossils that have important biogeographical data uh, that have some kind of phylogenetic information that are placed in a genus or a subgenus or some authority has squinted at it and asserted that this fossil is close to this other species, something like that. Um, the way I've uh, proposed to deal with that is use random, you put constraints on where that fossil goes in terms of dates and phylogeny, and then you randomly place them. Um, you could also do this uh, with, uh, it's not quite as nice as doing with a birth death sampling prior to beast. You could try that also, but if you have a ton of fossils, that starts to get to be a mixing machine and things like that. So this is a strategy you can be tried. Um, now, all of these uh, assume that you know the range at any particular fossil point on your tree. Um, sometimes you might be able to assume that, especially if you have continents and all your species are restricted to single continents or something, maybe it's a safe assumption, but often you don't really know that. Um, and uh, in some cases, even living taxa, this could be an issue. You know the fossil species has been found in region A, but maybe it used to live in B and humans drove it extinct 500 years ago or something. Um, or it hasn't been detected there. It's, it's an imaginable issue, although it should be uh, less of an issue. So uh, there's a few strategies for dealing with this. You could try the, what I call the question mark strategy. Um, for areas where you don't see the fossils, you put a question mark. Um, and that's, again, you would multiply the likelihoods uh, like we saw before. My experience with this is that if you have free parameters or you're trying different models with this, you, it leads to very uh, widespread ancestors and weird parameters where it's easy for the models to say, oh, well, everything lives everywhere then because there's no negative constraints on what the uh, ancestral ranges are, um, and you get to some uh, strange places. Um, I think a better strategy would be to have a model for imperfect detection. Um, and so here's, uh, here's a standard biogeography analysis where uh, you can represent it as a directed acyclic graph. Uh, you have a phylogeny, you have geographic data um, in the dark gray boxes um, for each species, and then you do ancestral state inference uh, under some model certain model parameters. Uh, we can change this so that now the observations are down here in these gray boxes, and these are counts of occurrences of each species, and they are counts of what I like to call a taponomic control, which is a bunch of other fossil uh, data that's approximately equally detectable. So for dogs, comparable fossils, maybe you know other mid to, mid to large sized uh, vertebrate fossils. Um, and if you have a count of how many fossils have been found in a particular time period in a particular region, you have some sense of how much sampling effort has been available. Um, and so if you have a ton of fossils in the area and you don't see your particular uh, dog species, well, then maybe it's not really there. You can put a probability on that given a sampling rate and a frequency of how many, you know, how many uh, fossils tend to be dogs versus other things. Um, if you have no, no occurrences of your species, but there's only one fossil of anything else ever found in that area, maybe you have no real information to say that the species wasn't um, so given that, we can put uh, likelihoods on the detection process as well, and then feed those into the analysis and, and do the standard uh, biogeographic analysis. So just to give you a, uh, uh, I tried this on the fossil dog data set. Um, our background <coughs> da database was uh, NeoMap and NOW databases, which are fossil databases, and Laura Sela assembled an occurrence database for our target plate. And uh, here's the discrete regions we used, seven discrete regions, 11 time bins to represent uh, over the last 11 million years or so, represent the formation of the Panamanian Isthmus. 
Beringia, uh, the uh, Saharan Desert. And uh, I used a, uh, what's called a plus W parameter to put a, so we have dispersal multipliers representing the relative plausibility of dispersal between these regions, but that's kind of a subjective decision, so we put a, an exponent W on that and estimated that. So W is estimated, estimated to be zero. We would have uh, uh, those that weight matrix would cancel out. If W was some other value, it'll scale it appropriately um, to try and find the optimal value. And I did by geographical stochastic mapping to get a sample of histories under a particular tree. All right, so here's an example of a few histories here. You can see that a lot of things don't change, but some uh, parts of the phylogeny change. And this is just a part of the tree because it's such a huge tree. It's hard to display. Um, and with by geographical stochastic mapping, we can actually uh, count, we get a count of events. Um, so we have jump events and range expansion events and other kinds of events. We get a sense of all right, and here, I couldn't do an animation because it's a PDF, but you can map the stochastic map on an actual map and get a sense of how many dispersals there have been between regions back and forth. So, the basic method, this would be the animation that doesn't work. Um, so that's the basic uh, by geographical method, um, and I encourage people to Google it and try it out. Um, there's some future work. Ideally, we would do this in sort of a joint Bayesian way and use fossil detection to influence the sampling rate and the birth death sampling process. Um, and that, uh, we've got a grant in New Zealand to actually work on that. Um, so I need to say one more thing before I get off the stage here, which is I read the abstract for the next talk, and it, um, I'm not going to prejudge everything that will be in the talk, but it does seem to assert that uh, one cannot compare uh, deck and deck plus J likelihoods, um, which is something I've been encouraging for a few years now. Um, so I put a link on Twitter. You can read uh, uh, my response to that. But the short version is yes, we can. Um, Mom says we can. And there's two pretty simple reasons. Um, one is you know, likelihood is the probability of the data given a model. Um, for a discrete data set, if we add up all the probabilities for uh, all of the different possible data sets, all the possible data patterns, uh, that should equal one. Um, and if you have that, then you have valid likelihoods. So I did this experiment, a two species tree with three areas. That means uh, eight possible ranges. Uh, 64 possible data patterns for two species, um, calculate the likelihood under deck and deck plus J, and there's all the calculations, you add them up. You actually get seven as a result under both models, and that's because we have eight possible areas, and one of those, or eight possible ranges, and one's the null range, which is an impossible ancestry. So if you multiply by uh, one seventh, you would get, as base frequencies, you would get one. So, so I think these are valid likelihoods, and so we can compare them. Um, Another thing worth noting is that these models are special cases of the Classy model. Classy is a phylogenetic state dependent speciation extinction. As I noted two years ago at the evolution meeting then, um, if we set extinction to zero, uh, set the speciation to be a Yule process, and uh, divide up that speciation process by the different kinds of phylogenetic events, um, then these models are equal, and uh, we can calculate likelihoods under both, uh, sort of biogeogarized models and Classy models, and they Really strong so, in conclusion, um, comparing uh, these two models is possible. It's saying that you can't compare them. It's like saying you can't compare two submodels of class C, or saying that it's not valid to compare two conditional probabilities, which is how we measure how models get the data. So, that's my talk, and I should probably uh, get off the stage. And thank you very much. <laughs>